Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is my review of the 2024 action spy comedy Argyle. Now, Argyle is one of those movies that, to me, is the epitome of a hard sell. Even though there was a ton of money spent on marketing, they got Dua Lipa to do a song for the soundtrack and actually appear in the movie. And you got some well-known uh, big names in the cast, like Henry Cavill, um, Bryce Dallas Howard, Brian Cranston, John Cena. It didn't really ultimately lead to something that was completely satisfying, let alone completely enjoyable. Like, it's one of those movies where I would say at best it's mid-tier. It's just middle of the road. It's just kind of there. It, it can be a time waster at best if you're in the right mood for it. But it's not really going to rise above anything more than that. There are a lot of other spy films that are considerably better than this. There are other spy parodies that are better than this. And it's just a weird mismatch of Romancing the Stone, a Roger Moore Bond movie, and of all things, The Long Kiss Goodnight. Now, the film is directed by Matthew Vaughn, and... Um, this is a passion project of his. I guess he really wanted to uh, do another sort of spy movie, but not in the same uh, realm as the Kingsman films. He wanted to do something that was uh, uh, different, that was a little bit more geared towards uh, comedy. Uh, the Kingsman films, there there is humor, but they're not really comedies. So I think that's really what he wanted to do is deconstruct uh, the spy franchise in his own way. And also at the same time, just have an avenue to be more silly and over the top. And apparently he thought this was a, a surefire uh, success because he already has plans for a trilogy and a spinoff and, a, and, and a tie in to the Kingsman series. And I don't know what he's thinking because, uh, this idea is not clever enough and it's not good enough period to warrant a trilogy, let alone multiple spinoffs. And look at the box office for this. Yeah, yeah, it won the opening weekend, but it wasn't competing against really anything. And if the rumors are true that it cost $200 million, and it also costs an extra $80 million in marketing, like this movie is more than likely not even going to break even at the box office. It's going to be a bomb. So there's no way that it's going to be a franchise now. Because it's not making enough money. So I don't know what Matthew Vaughn was thinking. I will say this though. His direction is fine. I think he still has uh, that touch. He still shoots action scenes. Uh, in a way that is. Relatively. Uh, uh, thrilling. And, and fun to watch. Uh, he still has an issue with an overabundance and over-reliance upon CGI though and it's really evident in this movie because this is a film that was shot and filmed I think during COVID and that led to a lot of green screen a lot of, of uh, post-production work and there's a lot of action bits like there's an opening car chase that is just completely CGI and it looks like something out of a video game. And there's a few other scenes throughout the movie that are like that and kind of take you out of the film. Uh, but I, I still think Matthew Vaughn did a pretty solid job directing this. I would say arguably the most consistent thing about this film quality wise is Matthew Vaughn's direction. 
or a performance or two by the cast. Uh, the direction, it definitely does show that he still is very proficient at shooting fight scenes, what little there are, or shootouts, or uh, shooting scenes that feature a lot of uh, different things happening in front of the screen. And it's not a static looking film. It does have a good energy to it. Um, so where the film really starts to, um, drop the ball, so to speak, is with the screenplay by Jason Fuchs, or might as well be Jason Fox, <laughs> because, uh, this script, this script honestly plays out like there was a certain point where the writer just completely stopped giving a fuck and just started uh, writing whatever came to his head and didn't really care whether or not it fit with the rest of the movie, tone-wise or story-wise. It just felt like one of those things where this guy was like, I don't give a fuck, I don't care anymore, uh, I, I, I'm just going to write whatever nonsense <laughs> I could pull out of my ass. This film, man... This script is just a complete and utter mess. And I'm going to give you a spoiler warning here because in order for me to really dissect this screenplay and my problems with it, I have to uh, talk about massive spoilers. So you've been warned. Now, the basic gist of the plot, I don't mind. It takes elements of something familiar like Romance in the Stone or even The Lost City. But it adds a little bit of a different twist on it because now instead of it being a romance movie parody, it's a spy movie parody. So it starts out one way where you think it's uh, going to be a movie that's going to focus on this writer named Ellie Conway who writes these Argyle novels. And the opening of the film is honestly pretty clever. It starts out as if you're watching a Argyle movie featuring Henry Cavill and his bad haircut with John Cena as his partner. And they're trying to chase Dua Lipa. And you're thinking, okay, this is going to be a self-referential spy movie. It's going to be meta. And it's going to be over the top and kind of silly. Okay, all right. But then you find out that that's just a, a, an excerpt from the book that the writer Ellie Conway is writing. And that Argyle isn't really a real character. And I don't mind how the script at times plays with this whole reality versus fiction kind of thing. I like the idea that her book is actually predicting what really happens in terms of world events and that different spies and and different uh, clandestine operations use her books uh, to uh, fuel or, or, or to uh, brainstorm for future schemes or concepts or things that they have to stop or they have to start. I don't mind that. I think that's fun. Uh, I like how she's introduced to the this real spy uh, named uh, Aiden. Yeah, so I think it's Aiden Wynn, I think, is, is the guy's last name. I could be wrong, though. But yeah, she's introduced to this real spy, Aiden. And he's the complete opposite of Argyle. I like that. Creates a kind of fun dynamic. I like the dynamic between her and her mom. The stuff with the cat is a bit um, a bit too much for me. I think they really kind of laid that on a bit too thick. But where the film really starts to lose me when it comes to the screenplay is when it starts to introduce a multitude of twists. And some of them are okay. Others are just ridiculous and dumb. 
So the movie to me, it's really like a, a, a story and a script that is written by three or four different writers just cramming all of their ideas into one story. And it's very unfocused. It's very chaotic. And it is. It's 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 a mess. It's a mess of different narratives, a mess of these different subplots and characters. And the first twist I thought was okay, where it introduced that the leader of this operation, uh, which I, I, I forgot what the name of it is, the division, the leader of this operation called the division is actually Ellie's father and her mother uh, actually is a, a part of the division because it was like a, an extra swerve because they swerve things into a, into a different direction earlier where it was insinuated that maybe uh, uh, Aiden was a double agent and that's why she went out on her own Ellie and then she wound up thinking that she was safe and sound at this hotel with her parents but the twist is that her parents aren't who they say they are. And then you find out that with another twist later on that she actually is the real Argyle and that her, what she thought was her mom and dad are these agents for the division and they brainwashed her with a laptop with, <laughs> with a spinning, uh, um, hypnotism, uh, wheel and they gave her these false memories and, and made her think that she was uh, Ellie Conway and what she thought was ideas that were coming from her head for her novel. They were just her memories that, from her previous life as a agent that were seeping through. And I appreciate it when a story is trying to provide some twists and turns, but at a certain point with this script, it just felt like there were way too many. And I think this is definitely one of them. Like you really lose, in my opinion, the strength of the film when you start to just make this into a kind of half-assed ripoff of the lost kit, the, the the long kiss goodnight. I almost said the lost kiss. I got confused with the lost city because that was also an, another uh, film that came out fairly recently. I think it came out like a year or two ago. And that had similar sort of elements in it. And yeah, it becomes this sort of half-assed ripoff of The Long Kiss Goodnight when, okay, there's this spy, she lost her memory, now she thinks she's something that she's not, instead of it being a happy homemaker and a mother who wouldn't hurt a fly, it's this... uh spy novel writer who's neurotic and and has has a lot of issues and and can't even fly a plane without getting freaked out and it goes even further because there's a point later on in the climax where she actually ice skates well it's not ice skates it's oil skates yes i said that oil skates in an action scene, and I'm like, really? And now it's not even uh, a, a, a thing where this isn't blatantly obvious. Now it's just crystal clear that you're ripping off the long kiss goodnight. Because <laughs> that had a whole action sequence featuring ice skates. And it made sense, though, because she was actually skating on ice. This made no sense whatsoever. And I would say the twists weren't even necessarily the worst part of the script for me. The worst part of the script for me was its painful attempts at humor. The uh, just spamming of the cat. And the climax. Because the climax, it's like the writer just took a bunch of stupid pills. <laughs> There's a whole scene where Sam Rockwell's character, Aiden, 
and the real Argyle, uh, uh, Agent R. Kyle, um, she and Aiden, they have a dance number, and it's an action scene. So they're dancing, and they're shooting people, and they're uh, throwing these uh, smoke grenades, and they have all these different colors. So it's like this rainbow of smoke grenades, and there's even a whole scene where uh, our Kyle, she like makes a heart. She makes a purple heart in the air with the smoke grenade. <laughs> it's like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. What, what happened to this movie? What is going on here? And then it just doubles down on the stupidity because then you get the oil skating scene where there's a whole room that's full of oil and R. Kyle grabs some knives sticks them to the bottom of her shoes and then she starts skating on oil. I'm like, I don't think that's how, how ice skating works. I don't think you can use regular skates on oil anyway. Uh, and you definitely can't use knife boots. Knife boots is not the same as actual <laughs> ice skates. And then you have this final fight of sorts between Kyle and Aiden and they're fighting because um, what Kyle thought was her mother had some uh, sort of fail safe programming that that she put inside of her head. You know, the kind of thing you see in these kind of spy things where they say a certain phrase or they play a certain song and it, it activates kill mode. And so that so kill mode is activated and she's trying to fight Aiden and they're also trying to upload this um, this file to this other guy who is a former CIA agent so they can shut down the division once and for all. And at n not at any point did you ever feel that, oh, they're not going to complete the mission. And then, of course, there's also this bit where this other character who is revealed to be based on a real person. It's somebody that is in the Argyle books as a member of Argyle's team, but it actually turns out to be uh, a person who was actually a part of the real Argyle's team in um, this character named Kira. She actually has the same name in the, in the book Argyle as well. And she just shows up randomly at the end and stops the 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 mom and smashes the music box and snaps Kyle out of it so she can stop punching her her boyfriend. And they send the the uh the file, which is what they were trying to find throughout the majority of the movie, by the way. So they they find they send the file to um Alfie. And Kyle and uh, Aiden, they live happily ever after. That's that's basically what it's insinuated as. Uh, Kyle goes back to her persona as Ellie Conway and writes the, the, the next or what is considered to be the last Argyle novel. And then you have a weird mid credit scene that's trying to tie things into the Kingsman. That there was a real Argyle, and he he worked for the Kingsman when he was uh, younger, and I'm like, what? What even is going on here? And yeah, it's just a f unfocused mess with just tonal shifts that are just really surprising, especially considering the fact that the script has lines of dialogue where it literally points that out. It talks about how, well, this, this is in the right tone. I'm like, you should have taken your own advice because then you get to like the finale and it's colored uh, uh, smoke bombs with hearts and dance numbers and oil skating. It's one of those screenplays where it would have been better if it just 
was simpler, to be perfectly honest. Less nonsense, less just shit flying around in random directions, and just more focus. Just don't even have the whole twist where she's a real spy and she actually worked for the division, but she went went rogue. Like I don't I, that's not needed. It's a cliche, but it works. It's a formula that has stood the test of time for a reason. And that formula is having a regular average person who is involved in this larger than life crazy scenario and situation. Should have just had it still be Ellie Conway. She's just using her writer's intuition to uh, lead Aiden along to the next clue, to the next spot, and they fall for each other throughout the film. That's that's really honestly all you needed because it seems like this was at its core trying to be more of a romantic comedy than really an action film anyway. So just lean harder into that direction and try to, instead of trying to have so many misdirects. And speaking of misdirects, like, yeah, misdirection comedy can work, but that didn't really seem like that was the vibe that the film was going for when it comes to its humor for the majority of the runtime until like the last 20 minutes or so now it's just misdirect comedy everywhere and just absolute absurdity and silliness pick a lane and stick to it uh that's so frustrating when you see a movie that just all of a sudden just goes wildly off the rails when it comes to its tone and its storytelling and the thing is I kind of didn't mind the movie early on. I was kind of getting into the story. I, I like the dynamic that the screenwriter uh, built between Ellie and Aiden. The The scene on the train was fun. The The sequence later on where they go to London, that was also fun. Uh, the best bits of comedy were just kind of uh, moments of banter between the two, like the head crushing bit. And then they just dropped that. In favor of these just random wild twists and just sheer absurdity and, and, and Looney Tunes type stuff. And I just, I just don't, I don't, I don't really get what they were going for uh, or what the writer was going for. Sorry. Uh, and the stuff with Argyle in particular, that was just awkward. Like the whole thing where Ellie is hallucinating that Aiden is Argyle, and then you find out later in another twist that Argyle is supposed to be like her subconscious that's coming through, and that's her, her real self. But why would she imagine it as the fictional uh, uh, character that she wrote for the Argyle novels? Is this one of those things where? There are a lot of things in this screenplay that just raise more questions than anything else. Or they just make you scratch your head. So, yeah, it's it's definitely a film that is let down considerably by the strength of its screenplay. The cast, though, I think is pretty strong. I, I think Bryce Dallas Howard, uh, Cake and All... Uh, I, I think she does a pretty, a pretty good job here playing both roles. Although I honestly feel she does a much better job playing Ellie Conway, the frazzled, uh, writer than she does playing the super spy, um, our Kyle, um, Sam Rockwell was awesome in this. He was the best part of the movie when it comes to, to, uh, uh, it's cast like I really enjoyed his performance so much. So I wish this, I wish he was just in a much better movie. This movie is just so mediocre and, and this performance deserves so much more than that. He's charismatic. He's funny. He's believable when it comes to the action scenes. 
I, I liked him so much in this. I want to see him do an action movie. Can somebody cast Sam Rockwell in, a, in an action movie, please? Like, maybe in the vein of Nobody or something? I would really, I would really like to see that, because he was great in this movie. Brian Cranston, fun to see him play another bad guy. He does a good job playing that role. Choose the scenery a few times, but that's what you want out of that kind of performance. Catherine O'Hara, it was a lot of fun to see her. It was a lot of fun to see her again. Uh, she did a good job, too, considering she, she was supposed to play Ruth Conway, the, the, the mom, and really played that role well, but then also played the role well of the nefarious uh, uh, evil spy who's uh, using mind manipulation on R. Kyle. And there were times where I, I got a little bit of her SCTV uh, characters, especially when she's playing the evil spy. I got a little bit of that SCTV vibe, which, honestly, I wouldn't have minded that more. Like, if if this film just leaned farther in that direction like is it going to be a rom-com or is it going to be a silly spy parody uh it, is it going to try to take itself seriously or is it trying to be over the top and dumb like you have to pick you have to pick either one you can't try to be all of them at once and at times it kind of did give me vibes of like an SCTV spy parody that you would see air on SCTV. So it fit that you had Catherine O'Hara in the cast. Honestly, I would have loved to have seen more of the SCTV cast. Uh, whoever is still around have little roles in this. Um, Henry Cavill and his stupid haircut. He's in it for like three minutes. There's really not much to say about this performance. Sophia Batella plays this Keeper of Secrets character. She's not in it much, which is good because she can't act. As soon as I saw her, I was like, oh, God. Now I'm having flashbacks of the Tom Cruise mummy movie. Oh, shit. The, 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 the crap is coming back. I can see it popping out of that ancient asshole again. Uh, but thankfully, she was only in it for like two minutes. Dua Lipa. I would say she's definitely a better singer than an actress, but I've seen worse. Uh, Ariana DeBose, uh, she was Kira, I think it, did Ariana DeBose, was she the one that sang the song? I think it might have been her, not Dua Lipa, that sang the Electric Energy song. Yeah, there's a song in the soundtrack called Electric Energy. I'll talk about the soundtrack a little bit later. You also have John Cena. Thankfully, he's also not in it for that long. Thank God. Why are they trying to force John Cena on us? He's not a good actor. He's not that charismatic either. Can, can we can we just stop? Can I I, I want to be like I can't see him cuz I don't I don't want to see him anymore. Sam Jackson, of course. He's in this movie. He's in everything. There's a whole moment where Sam Jackson's character Alfie is like super excited when he gets the the file delivery of like the the documents the that will uh destroyed the division and he's just like celebrating and hooting and hollering and i'm like that's when he that's when he got his paycheck that, that that's just him getting his paycheck for this movie he's just like yeah i <laughs> get another paycheck um but yeah not not really i would say the most um epic cast but everyone's pretty pretty good in the roles that they're asked to do richard e grant also cameos as some a fictionalized verser, version of uh, ritter in the argyle novels but i would say really it's bryce dallas howard and sam rockwell who do the majority of the heavy lifting and they're a good pair they have good chemistry just wish they were in a much better movie overall than whatever the hell this was Feature cinematography by George Richmond looks nice. It's a nice looking film. Has some good looking shots, especially when it comes to whatever location is actually shot at. Um, the editing by Lee Smith, Tom Harrison, Reed, and Cole Goody. 
at times it's a bit distracting, especially when it comes to the scenes where it's cutting back between Argyle and uh, Aiden during a fight scene. I get what they're trying to do, but it just looks very janky. And there's some other moments where the, the CGI is not really as well placed into a scene. And I don't know if that's really an editor problem, but then there's other problems with the editing, like the, the dance action number at the end, which has some really painfully bad looking uh, slow-mo. But it's not all bad. There are some moments where the editing is pretty decent, pretty uh, um, pretty good, especially when it comes to some of the fight scenes. Uh, the music by Lauren Balf, not what I would consider to be one of his most memorable scores, and at times it's a little too much. Like, it's too heavy. Like, there are moments in the film where it's too bombastic and it needs to be kind of a little bit more eased back. And it honestly sounds kind of generic at the end of the end of the day, too. Like you've heard this score a million times. The uh, songs they use for the soundtrack uh, uh, stood out more to me, uh, specifically Now and Then, the new song by the Beatles. It was nice to hear that incorporated into the film. There's even an instrumental version of that that's used in the score. I would say that's the best part of the score is the instrumental version of uh, Now and Then. Um there's also some other tracks that are utilized. Electric Energy, which is a new song. I believe it's by Ariana DeBose. I think that's who sang it. Could be Dua Lipa. I'm not 100% sure on either one. I'm not familiar with either of these women's music. Uh, but it's either or when it comes to that. Uh, Boy George also has some vocals on it. It's a fun, peppy song. Good little throwback. Uh, there's a, a funk song that was used during the action scene, the first action scene with Sam Rockwell that was an inspired, interesting choice. Uh, and during the dance action sequence with Aiden and R. Kyle, there's this song called Run by Leona Lewis. I don't really care for the way that that sequence is presented and edited. I think it's just laughable. But I like the song. I think the song actually is pretty, pretty good. I think it fits the 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 vibe and the, and the action well. I just wish that whole scene was just shot completely differently. And I think there's some other songs too, but those are the ones that that's, that honestly stood out the most for me. And this is a film that really does feel every bit of its over two hour runtime. I don't know why this was over two hours. It's two hours and 17 minutes. That's with the end credits. You take out the end credits and it's still two hours. That's still way too long. This movie needed to shave off at least like 20, maybe even 30 minutes, like a quicker pace probably would have helped this movie. And if you want to be zany, then just be full on zany then be full on zany and over the top and be at almost a, a cartoon James Bond Jr. kind of take on Romance in the Stone. Instead, it tries to be all these different things and it doesn't really succeed fully at being either one of these things because it's just trying to do too much. And yeah, the 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 best best way to describe the movie and i've said this numerous times in this review is that it's a total mess so i really don't know what else to say about argyle except uh thanks for watching uh my review and uh i'll see you later see ya